In 23 years of marriage, I never imagined the depth of betrayal I would face from the one person I thought I knew best. I have been a good wife to you, and I deserve a night with another man, she said, her words cutting through me like a knife. This wasn't just a breach of trust. It was a deliberate, calculated act that tore apart the fabric of our lives. The agony of her betrayal, the shock, and the subsequent unraveling of everything we had built together were almost too much to bear. This is my journey through betrayal and resilience. This is my story. Travis Wesley experienced the worst day of his life. It's not every day that your young, lovely wife of barely 23 years announces that she will begin dating other guys this evening. Travis sat calmly behind the kitchen table, clutching a glass of monkey shoulder whiskey for ten minutes. He avoided touching the golden liquid. He merely sat there, staring straight ahead, not seeing or hearing anything but experiencing enormous sorrow on the inside. Travis understood that not even Alka-Seltzer could alleviate his anguish. He had heard stories about other men's spouses telling them that they were dating other men, but he always thought it was just an urban tale. How could a woman expect her loving spouse to agree to such a thing? Travis couldn't believe a lady could be so unconcerned about her spouse, so plainly selfish in her aspirations. Of course, this occurred on a Monday, but it was a pleasant day. And his company? He even exited the office a few minutes after five, whistling a pleasant tune. When he returned home, he was still feeling positive until he noticed his wife sitting at the kitchen table, pouring herself a glass of red wine and holding a glass and bottle of his favorite whiskey. He dropped his briefcase, poured himself a drink, and sat down in a chair. What is your secret, Warren? Travis asked, noting his wife's sneaky smirk. His wife looked him in the eyes and smirked. What he saw in her eyes made him apprehensive. He gave an anxious grimace. Do you believe I've been a decent wife and mother throughout the years? She asked quietly. Travis furrowed his brow. He knew his wife understood how thoughtful he was, and she could almost see the wheels spinning in his head before he said yes. I believe so. And what are you trying to convey with that? He asked calmly. Travis paused for several seconds, carefully considering his response. Do you believe they should be compensated for performing my responsibilities as a decent spouse and father? He asked. What type of question is that? Travis Lawrence snapped angrily. Today I want to go on a date with another man, she stated. Come like a lark on a bright morning. Travis was glad to be sitting down. He felt bile rising in his stomach. His ideas were like a clean slate, completely empty, a date. He struggled to say, with another man. Lauren nodded slowly at her husband as if he were a foolish child. Yes, with another man. Travis, I haven't had a date with another man since you and I were exclusive 24 years ago. I've been a good wife to you and a nice mother to your children, and I deserve to spend the night with another man. It's a chance to try something new, not someone to love. Nothing except bliss. I'm 47, and I can't keep my beauty forever. I want to try more men, but I'm still a desirable woman who can get them with the flip of a finger. Travis's lower jaw progressively fell. He knew he had read his wife correctly, but surely she couldn't be serious, could she? He did not even need to pose the question. Lauren nodded at him as if reading his mind. Damn, he mumbled as she rose from the table and walked up the stairs to her bedroom to change clothes. Warren looked terrific as she walked down the stairs in a little black dress that virtually clung to her gorgeous figure in front. She had a cutout in the middle of her chest, and it was barely long enough to reach the middle of her thighs. The makeup was mild. A lovely woman does not require much, and her long blonde hair was pulled back into a high ponytail. The spectacle was incredible. She realized that her spouse was entirely hers at this point. And I will not let it happen, Lauren Travis said, rising from the table. What are you thinking or doing? You won't do this while staying with my wife. Lauren's beautiful smile transformed into an unpleasant smirk. You will not ruin the evening for me. Trav, you can be challenging, but you know you are not going to divorce me because of this. Where would you find a woman like me if you let me go? Nowhere. You are already aware of this. The children will be upset at you for wrecking our family. Suck it up, Travis. Allow me to have fun for a few years, and then it will be just you and me again. We shall grow old together. You know you adore me. You do not want to be alone for the rest of your life. Why? Of males to choose from when the automobile siren sounded. 
Warren took the tiny package and stepped over to Travis, attempting to kiss him farewell. Her husband flinched as if from a minor shock and backed away to the side. Lauren appeared astonished and hurt for a second before her expression changed to fury. I'll be returning home. I don't know one, she said before departing. He stared in horror as she walked out the door. Could his 23-year marriage be ending? He appears to have assumed Lauren would not return his gaze. She stepped out the door. Scientists discovered a sad but genuine fact. People with attractive appearances have an advantage in life over their more average counterparts. They make friends more readily, get more attention, and teachers are more likely to give them higher grades. In Warren's case, it worked that way and only grew worse when she turned 13 and her chest completely expanded. She quickly realized that if she batted her eyes and smiled, she could get practically any boy she desired. And for the boys who were playing hard to get, she merely puffed and straightened her chest slightly. The agreement was sealed. Travis, like nearly every other boy she met, fell under Lauren's spell almost immediately. His family moved to the city the summer before he started eighth school. He met Lauren on the first day of school and was immediately intrigued. Travis was an excellent athlete and well-liked by his classmates. Eventually, he mustered the guts to ask Lauren out on a high school date, and she agreed. They became a couple and stayed together until the first few weeks of their junior year at the local high school, when Warren dumped the young man in favor of Landon, a starter on the school's football team. Travis was 1.63 meters tall and weighed 50 kilograms at the time. Despite his height of 1.8 meters and weight of 86 pounds, Travis accepted his fate. He realized Lauren was out of his league in terms of appearance. Most of the lads at school were out of Lauren's league in terms of appearance because she was dating a football star. She hung out with the famous students at school. Travis was one of the faceless minions that wandered the halls. He dated and got acquainted with a few students, but did not interact with Lauren. During his school years, he saw that the few times she met him in person, she acted as if he were a complete stranger. He was outraged the first time it happened, but by senior year, he had come to accept it. Travis had grown 23 centimeters and gained 18 kilograms. He was a gorgeous and athletic young man, yet he looked far from tired. Of course, you were like that. He attended the prom with his lovely but not remarkable girlfriend. That evening, they gave each other their untouchables. Lauren was the prom queen while her date was the prom king. They also spent the night following graduation. Before this incident, she was far from untouchable. Lauren was sometimes manipulated, sometimes not. Into was always on the menu for any male who was lucky enough to date her. Travis studied accounting at Michigan State University after graduating from high school. During his four years of study, he dated a few girls but had no significant relationships. Lauren attended Central Michigan University and majored in marketing. During her undergraduate years, she dated and slept with several guys, including a marketing professor to improve her grade point average. Lauren had honed her skills at the game over the years as the object of desire. They both landed employment in Grand Rapids after graduating from college. About a year after graduating from university, Travis and several of his co-workers were spending a Friday night at a popular bar and restaurant. When Warren strolled in with two women, everyone turned to stare at the stunning woman in the short green dress with a low neckline. Lauren didn't pay much attention because it was expected, and she was used to it. Who is this goddess? Steve White croaked in front of his entire table of colleagues, leaving no time to consider his statements. Travis reflexively responded, This, ladies and gentlemen, is Lauren, the goddess in your humble servant eighth grade girlfriend. Every head at the table shifted from a lady to Travis. Many of them had their mouths open. Have you met her? One of them inquired incredulously. Travis Winston was displeased. He despised calling attention to himself. Is anyone paying attention? I was approximately 14 years old when we entered senior high school. I was covered in a copper basin, and she disregarded me for years as if I were the invisible man. He remarked gently, At least you have a good story about groping. One of the women at the table joked with one of the team members. The entire squad burst into happy laughing. Lauren and her companions exchanged looks for a brief moment. She believed she knew one of the men at the table but wasn't certain. Lauren sat at an adjacent table facing the men she recognized. Dude, are you not going to come over and say hello? White asked. Jesus, Steve, you are drooling. 
Very unimpressive, said the first interviewer. Casey Jello pretended she hadn't known me for four years. I don't understand why she remembers me now, Travis said. Several heads nodded in accord as they continued to examine the man eating her food. Then she snapped her fingers and pointed at the man. It is not good, Lauren, one of her friends said. If you gesture at someone at a restaurant, you could be wounded in some places. She totally ignored her friend's remark. I'll be right back, she announced. I need to say hello to an old friend. Lauren virtually leaped out of her chair and walked over to the table where Travis was seated. Traffic, hello. Lauren approached him and exclaimed, I'm so glad to see you. Travis rolled his eyes at his friends before turning to meet his former classmate with a phony, pleasant look. Lauren, it's lovely to see you, Travis remarked, almost without emotion, rising to his feet. Lauren entered Travis's personal space and gently kissed him on the lips before laying her hands on his shoulders. His co-workers sat shocked. Travis was startled as well. Lauren noticed this and smiled at him with a not-so-innocent expression. She was very comfortable playing this game, and she knew he couldn't do it. Let's get to our table. I'll introduce you to the girls, she explained. She grasped his hand and virtually dragged him to the table. He spent much of the evening with Lauren and her two companions before departing. Lauren seized his phone, inputted her own number, and scribbled down his number for herself. Lauren was more than fascinated by Travis's seeming indifference to her. It had never happened to her before. He was cordial in the restaurant, but he spent as much time talking to her two friends as he did with her that evening. She kissed him on the lips multiple times, but he never returned the kiss. Travis's co-workers at the bar confronted him about his relationship with the goddess on Monday morning, and they were taken aback when he informed them he stayed there for approximately an hour before going home. She's impressive, but she's 14 levels higher than me. I understand, he mumbled. I don't need all of this grief. Travis was met with sorrow in the parking lot of his employment two days later as he was leaving. He grumbled to himself as he spotted his automobile waiting for him. Although he had to acknowledge that the address was one size too tiny, she appeared to be interested in monastic life. Why haven't you called Travis? She asked quietly as he neared her. Travis tried not to enlarge his eyes as he looked Lauren up and down, ravenous for his first meal in weeks. The low-cut top was unbuttoned all the way down, with a cleavage in the hem that ended about five centimeters below her crotch. Damn it, he mumbled to himself as she leaned forward, wrapping her arms around his neck and kissing his lips. He was powerless as her tongue slithered inside his mouth like a snake and assaulted him. He threw his briefcase, and the kiss went on endlessly. Several of his co-workers, who had halted in disbelief, hastily got into their cars and drove away. They proceeded to a restaurant some distance from the city center and ate happily. Lauren, on the other hand, spent the majority of her lunchtime tugging on the bottom of her dress. Travis and the young waitress appeared to enjoy her struggle. Travis was tired of Lauren, but he was only a man in the presence of a barely clothed beauty who had turned on her charm. He was toast. The most he could aspire for was to do well in bed that night. My God. Travis mumbled to himself as he had his first glimpse at Lauren San's clothes. Travis had always considered this woman to be a goddess. If this was his only chance to give it his all, he needed to be sure that he wouldn't miss his serve because lust would take over his emotions. After finishing their meal, they lay face to face and peered into each other's eyes. Lauren smirked at Lecherous Lee. She murmured, Apparently, I screwed up big time a few years ago. You have exceptional ability. Who would have thought? If only I'd known. We've lost a few years, Travis. Lauren recognized what was going on in front of her. Travis wasn't her type in terms of appearance, but he was still attractive and fit. He appeared to have a promising career ahead of him. He's also perfect in bed, she reasoned. Nevertheless, she said nothing. Despite Travis's reservations about this woman, which stemmed primarily from her self-esteem, their relationship progressively improved. Although her attractiveness was obvious, he gradually fell in love with Lauren. I purchased an engagement ring, but before proposing, they sat down and discussed their perspectives on fidelity. She had impressed them thus far, but Travis wanted everything to be heard between them. Obviously, I only know a little about your past. I'm not going to ask about numbers or names, Travis replied as they sat down at the table for a serious discussion. 
What happened in the past will stay in the past. The same goes for me. But I want to know about the future. From now on, I want us to be completely exclusive. No ifs, ands, or buts. If you do not believe you can do this for us, please let me know right away. He put a little black box on the table between them. Lauren glanced directly into Travis's eyes, then returned to the box. I'll never cheat on my hubby. Never. Travis remembered the words. Apparently his wife did not consider this unfaithful because she had warned him in advance. He knew it wasn't true. She hoped he'd take it that way because if not, he wouldn't accept it. Travis knew Lauren had plenty of opportunities to cheat throughout the years. As far as he could determine, she had rejected them all, as a decent wife should. She was a 10 out of 12, and he regarded himself a 6 at best. This provided ample opportunity for someone closer to her physical level to sneak into the house and make a statement. Assuming she did not have an affair that he was unaware of, she lived for 23 years as a legitimate wife. Travis realized he should be grateful for these years, but he wasn't. When he declared, I love you, he wanted it to last forever, not just 23 years. In fact, not a week had passed without Lauren receiving offers from someone, not just from the guys. She understood that she was more than just attractive. She was excellent, a rare goddess and wonderfully stunning woman. When God made his wife, he had a wonderful day. Travis always stated that Lauren had told Travis about it the first time she had been touched on, in order to be entirely truthful. However, after a few years, Travis stated that he trusted her enough that she did not need to tell him everything. The only time you'd want to know she was being harassed is if the past did not accept her first refusal, in which case you'd take the proper actions to remove the offender. In contrast, Travis was rarely contacted by women. This was partly because he used his wedding ring as a shield within minutes of meeting a woman. Travis spoke glowingly about his wife and children, usually extinguishing any sparks that could have ignited. He hadn't even realized what he was doing. Most ladies shut down before they even had the opportunity to flirt. Lauren had no idea her spouse was blocking prospective flirts or worse. The almost fairy tale marriage lasted 22 years before Rosa Esposito entered the mythical Garden of Eden, or rather, began working at the same public relations agency as Lauren. According to a Bob Seeger song, she was a dark haired beauty with big brown eyes and a large chest. Men were attracted in the same way that a strong magnet attracts metal. In any other office, she would have been the dominant female. But at Super Solutions, she was best described as a devoted assistant to the world's hottest lady. Rose, 42, had been married for 15 years, but in her own words, was dissatisfied with it. She had multiple indiscretions, both with and without her husband's knowledge, and she frequently told Lauren about her exploits. She was an excellent storyteller, and her stories were filled with. The majority of her romantic interests are outstanding. So, you haven't tried anyone since your marriage? You're just a fantastic woman, but I don't think you don't want it. Rose commented one day at work during her coffee break. I'm not denying that I'm inquisitive, but I would never cheat on Travis or on set in recent months. Lauren had observed that she was receiving less attention from men in bars and restaurants than she had in the past. She realized that the stares she had previously received were being returned by younger women, and she began to doubt her ability to visually attract, let alone play the what-if game. What if he allows you to try? So what happens next? Asked Rose. Lauren's look indicated that she had never considered such a possibility before. The wheels in her head were spinning frantically. Lauren said with a sly grin, I suppose if I had permission, it would be a totally different story. Have you ever considered requesting permission? Asked Rose. You understand that anything worth having is worth asking for. Lauren had never considered this before. Her face flared up and then went dark. He will not give me permission. Never, Lauren said. Should I handle everything for you? Asked Rose. Unspoken permission. Tell him, and then grab anything you want regardless of his response. Tell him that he loves you enough to allow you to do this, that you can overcome this since it has nothing to do with love, that you love only him. Travis was awakened by the sound of a car approaching the home, and he looked at his watch. He noticed it was a bit after 3 a.m., a peek at the bottle of Woodford Reserve revealed that he had consumed around half of it. Good evening, he said to a woman as she entered the front door. Travis took a hard look at the cliché his wife had become. 
Her hair was brushed but disheveled. Her makeup had vanished. Her clothes appeared rumpled. She seemed smug rather than regretful. I could see you, she asked. You didn't need to wait. You understand. I am going to sleep in. Maybe. But not again in this life with you. He snapped back. Lauren looked at him disgustedly and walked up the stairs. Travis put three more fingers of bourbon into his glass and returned to watching ESPN. He spent the night in his folding chair, partly sitting and half lying, with his stomach churning. He finally got out of his chair at about 9 a.m. and made himself breakfast while eating. He heard the shower start in the main bathroom. Under normal circumstances, Travis would have anticipated his wife to arrive downstairs in a robe and with her hair wrapped in a towel this morning. She didn't come down for about an hour, and when she did, her hair was dehydrated. She was dressed, made up, and looked impeccable as always. He didn't expect anything less. Did you leave me some food? She asked. I brewed a large pot of coffee, but kept the food for myself. And since you're clothed at home, now is the moment to talk, he stated unequivocally. Travis seemed emotionless, which startled Lauren. She'd chosen him to just foam at the mouth and be insane, making him easy to manipulate. Rational Travis would make the conversation far more complex. She reasoned with herself. Don't you want to know what happened last night? She spoke quietly. Travis noticed a sense of superiority in her tone. Does she honestly believe he wants to hear how he was duped? Hardly. I'd like to know how you view our marriage progressing. Travis spoke, his voice no louder than hers. As I mentioned yesterday, I plan to test several additional males over several years. I only want closeness, no love. I only adore you. But I'd like to try a couple more males while I still have the looks and shape. I gave you everything for 23 years and I never considered betrayal. I want to experience the thrill of something new. You're fantastic in bed, but I'd like some variation. Well, I've had some other experience for a time. Then you and I will set off into the sunset together, and I'll be grateful to you for the experience. It will spoil you entirely for the rest of your life. Instead, Travis listened closely as Lauren spoke while making toast and jam for his coffee. He believed the way she buttered the toast while discussing the most essential aspects of his life was indifferent. He had a lot of questions. Is it all because you seek variety? Aren't I enough for you? He asked, creaking. She began to respond, but he interrupted her. So, do you want to live in an open marriage for a few years before returning to monogamy later? Does this mean that I can date other people? Lauren attempted but failed to stifle her giggles. The thought of her gentle, quiet husband asking another woman out on a date was ridiculous. Travis was more serious about marriage than any other man she had ever met. However, if this is required for him to accept it in principle, yes, she responded. Of course, it should be just as intimate for you. Travis lifted his eyebrows and shrugged. Lauren had no idea what this movement was, but she did have an idea. So, do you want to go on a date with Rose? You know, a lovely woman at my office? I'm sure she'll happily agree, Lauren said, knowing that her friend would have no difficulty spending the night with her husband, especially if it meant assisting Lauren in achieving her aim of having personal relationships with other men while remaining married. Travis appeared puzzled. The lustful 21-year-old bachelor had no desire to get Rose, and the responsible 47-year-old married man knew he couldn't. I'd be happy to go on a date with Rose, but no baby. Thank you. That will make me as much of a traitor as you were last night, he declared. Lauren's smile quickly transformed into an angry frown. I am not a traitor, she cried. Okay, if you insist, baby. He was much more severe than she had anticipated, but I'm afraid I still have to disagree with it. Well, come to your senses, sweetie, because I shall do this even if you refuse. She snorted at 11 a.m. on Monday. Rose entered Lauren's workplace and noticed that she did not appear happy. To hell with this bigot and his horse. He came on. Lawn snarled and closed the office door behind Rose. Damn that. He declined to date you. Rose frowned. I had no idea I was on the menu, but what the heck? How could you deny this? She spoke while rubbing her body with her hands. How about a date? Did you have a wonderful time or did Travis wreck it? Asked Rose. The date was unique. Jones really knows how to make a woman feel happy and energized. God, it's been a long time since I felt another man. I absolutely prefer the difference. Who should I try next? They both laughed heartily. Lauren felt pleased that she was not quickly served with divorce papers because she and her spouse needed more communication. 
She felt it was best not to ask about his plans at all. However, he did not inform his wife. Travis did not want to rush into a divorce. I hope she rapidly comes to her senses and abandons her silly cuckolding schemes. He was confident that if she stopped this nonsense, he would be able to forgive her and forget about her transgression. His hopes were raised when Warren did not go on a date the following week, but he still did not return to the bedroom, and they were not communicating well. Lauren, on the other hand, was dressed to the nines the following Friday evening as if she were going out. Are you really going to do this again with the same guy, or do you want to employ someone else? What about this week? Travis inquired aggressively. Damn, Trav, didn't you hear what I said? This is not about you. It's about me and my ambition to get anything before I become too old to interest anyone. I don't desire you less. I want something different, you know? People are continuously pestering me. I want to enjoy it. I will always come back to you, she added. What if I don't want you to go back with me? I will not share it with you. I will not sit idly by while you enjoy pleasure. I wasn't designed for this. I'll wait until you've tried. Half of our city's male population. I wasn't sure when you had your first date, but I believe I can withstand it once. It could have been severe idiocy, but it was also great contempt, extreme treachery. Stay outside and party all night. We're finished. This is not why I was put on this planet, he continued, his voice quivering. Why WW? She spoke using the fingers of her right hand. You do not want to lose me. It doesn't have to be either or, he said last week. Travis asked his lawyer to prepare all of the necessary documentation, hoping they would be fine. He intended to call his wife on Monday morning, but first, he wanted to inform his two children. Jackie, 21, and Michelle, 19, didn't trust their father when he contacted them that evening, at least not overtly. But after speaking with both, he realized that his eldest daughter may not have simply assumed that something was wrong. So you knew she was going to create this nightmare, but didn't warn me. He shouted into the phone. I don't know what's going to happen. Please, Dad. I found myself in a challenging circumstance. One of you would be unhappy with me regardless of what I did. Besides, it is your body. It does not belong to you. And if she wishes to share it, stop. Do not continue, Travis shouted. I understand she put you between us, but don't tell me she can do anything she wants. She can do whatever she wants with her body because it is hers. We took vows. He went on to say that the oath prohibits him from speaking about her body. I understand. She mumbled briefly and then went silent. Damn, baby, I apologize, Daddy, she whispered. Warren went through the door around 2 a.m. Travis was nowhere to be seen, even if she arrived an hour sooner than the prior date. She appeared a little more shabby. Gabriel Esposito was a large, muscular man with tremendous physical strength, possibly the most powerful Lauren had ever encountered in bed. By the end of the evening, she could hardly move. She was aware that by tomorrow, she would most likely have a few bruises from his grip. Overall, it was an excellent night. She hoped she could appreciate Gabriel again. Lauren was surprised and mortified when she received divorce papers at her office on Monday morning. She burst into tears and dashed to the ladies' room a few moments later. When Rose heard the noise, she appeared. Rose remarked, You should have known he'd give you the documents. You seriously injured him, baby. This is how he hurts your back. Eye for an eye. Men are like children. He's attempting to persuade you to force things. He refuses to give up his 23-year marriage and part of his belongings. Give him a week alone and he'll come crawling back, she added, attempting to console her. She straightened up more and returned to her workstation. She picked up the phone and instantly dialed her husband's number. How could you do this to me, at the office, in front of everyone? I understand you are struggling, but I deserve better. She virtually yelled into the telephone. After 23 years, don't I deserve something greater than opting to open our marriage if I'm not the appropriate person for you? Could you have warned me ahead of time and parted ways civilly? Travis stated. I do not desire civility. I do not want to get divorced. I still love you. Do you still love me? She wailed. I still love you. But every time you spend a night with someone else, the love fades. He let out a growl. My passion is not like yours in that it has no end. I've always believed this was true. Who knows? Perhaps we were both mistaken. Lauren struggled with her divorce. Her lawyer sought and got marriage counseling. Travis was fiercely opposed. Lauren grinned, and Travis grimaced as they were escorted into the consultant's secret sanctuary, where they discovered Lily and Carmack sitting on one of the chairs at the desk. 
Data on marriage counselors suggests that the majority feel their role is to reconcile divorced couples, with female counselors being biased in favor of women. The consultant started. Let's begin by rectifying the errors. Mrs. Leslie, let's start with the simplest thing. Did you honestly inform your husband that you planned to date other men for a few years? Travis did his best to keep the consultant from seeing his smirk. Lauren tried not to show the consultant how astonished she was. She considered lying, but then realized she didn't have a ready-made legend for the lie. Yes, yes. I informed him about it, and she responded softly. That is what I desire. I don't need him to do something for me. Our marriage will be unaffected by this. Well, we will end here, remarked the consultant. Sorry for wasting your time, Mrs. Wesley. I'll speak with the judge about this farce. Lauren started to stutter. Honey, if you believed what you did to your spouse would work for me, you were insane. You should feel embarrassed of yourself. But you obviously have no sense of shame. Honestly, miss, I feel disgusted, Calicow explained. Over the next month, I called and texted Travis numerous times per day while he rented a modest apartment near his house. He did not respond to calls or text messages. She then appealed to their daughters for assistance, who called multiple times. Dad, you know you still adore her. If she stopped dating other guys, would you give her another chance? Michelle inquired on one of the calls. So, does she continue to do this even after I have served her? Travis asked with a shaking voice. He received just quiet in answer. That was all the response he needed. Michelle did not call again or ask him to try again. Travis was startled by how rapidly word spread about his imminent divorce, particularly among unmarried women. Several ladies at his workplace, as well as several women who were friends with him and his wife, conveyed their condolences about his marital issues. He was astute enough to recognize that not all of their condolences were selfless. Connie's mother, his wife's lifelong friend, contacted her to express her sadness over Travis's situation. She almost immediately provided him a shoulder to weep on, not just any shoulder. Travis was taken aback by his wife's close friend's open sexual advances. Throughout their years of friendship, the divorced woman never took a hard look at him. I would never seek my friend's husband. It's simply wrong, she informed him. However, now that you are free, the rules are different. I'm letting you know I'm interested in you. I am shocked. I am flattered, but I am not yet a free man. Carney and I will only date once our divorce is finalized. Travis stated, I know I'm being stupid, but I'm not going to cheat. You are such a boy scout. Travis, this is one of the things I enjoy about you. I've always enjoyed it. Can you at least set me up on a date when you're free? Connie asked. Of course, Travis answered. But I don't want to come between you and Lauren. You have been pals for many years. I appreciate your sensitivity, but just because it's foolish doesn't mean I should pass up on a friendly individual. I wouldn't have thought twice if you were simply some random man I met, Connie said. I'll call you when I remove the leash. Travis made a joke. Connie was a five-foot-tall Asian beauty with a toned figure and waist-length black hair, which Travis considered one of her best features. He admits to himself that he was shocked by the woman's interest in him. Travis kept his word and called Connie on the day his divorce became legal. On Saturday evening, they headed to a restaurant before going to a jazz club. Connie observed how Travis was feeling and commented on it. He said, I feel like an inexperienced 15-year-old. I haven't had a date with another woman in almost 26 years. Don't tell me the protection in your wallet is the same as on your previous date with Lauren, she joked. Should I have gotten some protection crap? I didn't think about it. Well, I'm a newbie, Travis said at the conclusion of the evening. Connie gently kissed Travis on the lips. They both felt wonderful after their date, and he vowed to call again. Travis didn't think much about taking off his wedding band on the day the divorce was finalized. Still, it was a significant thing for unmarried women. He notices the vacancy on his ring finger. Several female employees took note and commented on it, and the amount of flirtation in his office escalated dramatically. This was new to him. One day around lunch, he informed his best friend at work about it. There are many gorgeous women in this office. How had I not noticed this before? Travis asked. You, my friend, were a terrible henpecked man, Robert Ardo stated. You were so in love with this woman that you didn't see other women as intimate creatures. I mean, she is undeniably attractive. But you allowed her to put your courage in her handbag. And perhaps it was part of the problem. 
She is always being checked for value, and you are so schooled, with such a frequency emanating from you, that not a single lady glanced at you in the first month after your divorce, in the first month following the divorce. Travis went on four dates, including two with Connie. He hadn't had sex with any of the three women he had dated, but that wasn't his purpose. In the second month, he was still in high demand, sleeping with two different ladies. Travis's daughters, who have spent more time with their mother than with their father in recent months, have heard or repeatedly stated that while she can have almost any man with the snap of her fingers, their father is an ordinary man in his 40s who struggles to find a mate, let alone a permanent girlfriend. They started to feel sorry for their father. One Saturday morning, roughly two months after the divorce, they went to his apartment uninvited. Travis was upset that he was woken up at 8.36, especially after he had entertained his partner until late the night before. Sonia, a busted 25-year-old girl, was the daughter of a friend who required a dependable male for a wedding celebration. The evening was so enjoyable that the pair decided to end it at Travis's apartment. She was resting in his bed when he opened the door wearing a robe. What? he questioned, pushing open the door to see his girls smiling as they held bags of bagels, smoked salmon, and cream cheese. Hello, father. Could your two lovely daughters come over for breakfast? Jackie spoke as the pair entered the house. Travis kissed them both on the cheek before leading them to the kitchen table, where they emptied the bags they had brought with them. They had just finished soaking the bagels when they emerged from the bedroom. They were wearing one of Travis's white shirts, half-buttoned, and most likely wearing nothing else. Sorry, darling, I didn't realize you were expecting guests, Sonia remarked. Mom mentioned that you were your own boss. No, Sonia, these are my daughters, Jackie and Michelle, he added, pointing to them with their respective names. We went for a brunch bagel with salmon. Sonia giggled, allowing her vast chest to quiver beneath her shirt. She brushed across Travis's arm before sinking onto the chair next to him. For a while, the four of them made regular small conversations before Jackie inquired whether Travis had recently communicated with Lauren. For the first time in days, he believed that being around Sonia made it nearly impossible to remain sad, even if she was a touch rough for his 48-year-old physique. Michelle added, I have to tell you, Dad, we thought you were already missing, Mom. We know she misses you, but I assumed that after I was gone, she would live her life to the fullest. I know I was an anchor for her, however. She was also spending time with them on our old bed. Dad, Jackie exclaimed. Sonia giggled, and Michelle frowned. She's not a ledger, you understand? Really? Think about it for a second. How many different males has she had a night with since our breakup, and those I was aware of prior to my departure? The two girls flushed and bowed their heads. Wow. What if it's two days every month for ten months? That's twenty different guys with three guys each month. 30 for me. There are a lot of guys, Sonia explained. If looks could kill, Travis's girls would have Sonia dead in seconds. She was well aware of the reality. Don't blame me if a woman can't keep her legs closed, Sonia replied. Children, children, Travis responded. Let's not ruin my good weekend. Sorry, the three young women mumbled at the same time. So you're a couple? Jackie asked Sonia quietly. You don't look any older than me. Your father mentioned we were the same age. But do not worry. I'm never going to become your stepmother. We are just pals. He's a fantastic person. He was my date at the wedding reception last night, and he's rather attractive. Did I mention he's a lovely guy? We have to agree that he's a fantastic guy, even if he can be a jerk on occasion, Jackie added. And yes, he is attractive to a man your father's age. Sonia's time to flush. Travis, too, blushed. Hey, baby, remember when we had lunch with the newlyweds' families at the hotel at noon? I need to shower and get some clothing from my place before we leave, Sonia stated. Both daughters rolled their eyes at the father. Jackie told her mother over lunch a few weeks later, she's my age, and it didn't appear to be an isolated incident. They spent quite some time together. They enjoyed each other's company. I doubt he'll crawl to you soon, Mom. No, you've just caught him on a lucky day. He was probably assisting a friend's youngster and got lucky. He's undoubtedly a female who follows the simple virtue rule, isn't he? With anyone? Your father is a lovely guy, but he is not a stud. Jackie. Jackie raised an eyebrow at her mother. You always seemed happy with him until you told him you were leaving him. Why didn't you cheat on him without telling him? 
Wouldn't that be much easier? You might as well have your cake and eat it. That would be cheating, Jackie. And if he caught me, we'd break up. After telling him about it, I didn't cheat and was confident that he'd give me what I wanted when he recognized just what he was going to lose. I must admit that I didn't expect a divorce. I never imagined he'd have the guts to do it. Mom, I believe you misunderstood love for weakness. And somewhere along the way, you determined that everything rested exclusively on you. Was it all worthwhile? For the first time, Lorian's face revealed the strain of what she had to bear. From roses to lips, everything sounded far better than it actually was. She couldn't explain to her daughter that the intern was average. But no, it was not worth it. She also couldn't tell her kid that she never imagined Travis would do anything other than sit around and fantasize about his lovely ex-wife. She was so self-centered that she had no concept that a handsome, if not gorgeous, man with high character intelligence and a stable profession may be appealing in the singles market. And this isn't only for middle-aged women. She was aware that following the divorce, her ex-husband had dated various women, including her old friend Connie, and was now with a young woman of easy virtue, the same age as their eldest daughter. Instead of remaining at home in sorrow for his former life, he goes on dates like a single 20-year-old and receives more attention than he deserves. She didn't inform Connie when she learned her buddy was seeing her ex for the first time, assuming it was a pity date. But the second date was totally unnecessary, and she told Connie personally in a fairly loud voice, I thought we were pals. Connie, it would help if you were on my side. We girls need to look out for each other. But he did nothing wrong with you, Lauren, and he's a good person. Great. He embodies all I want in a man. Why am I not dating Trevor? How women are lined up to date him. He's prime beef on the hook, lady, and he's a wonderful gentleman, also unique in bed. I will go on a date with him whenever he invites me. How could you drive that meanly? Lauren is softly driving her companion, her mouth open. She was only now realizing how quickly her mistake was growing. She adores Travis and despises coming home to an empty house at the end of the day. She hates sleeping alone at night. Travis could not have predicted that his life would become so lively. He would be content with his old, monotonous life. Aside from that, things were very good for him. Work is good, and his social life is excellent. He enjoys being with ladies of various ages and spends the majority of his dates in bed. He is not currently searching for a long-term partner, but he did enjoy the buffet. There is more to life than simply marrying a beautiful woman. Marla Goodling, shoulder-length silver hair streaked with purple in a ponytail, appeared out of a hole in the rear of a Chicago Cubs baseball cap. Her blue Cubs t-shirt embraced her ample chest and light blue skin. Despite her age of 60, Levi's stuck to her form. She garnered more than her fair share of looks from the left-field bleachers at Wrigley Field. One of the individuals evaluating her was the man she was with, Travis Wesley, the ex-husband of one of her long-term employees. Braun, Wesley, and Travis went to a Cubs game as part of a weekend trip to Chicago. Marla had worked with Warren Wesley for more than 15 years. I met Travis at various corporate gatherings when he accompanied his then-wife and always thought he was a lovely and kind guy, she told herself. She was aware that she and Warren had split approximately two years ago. Marla has been a widow for around five years. Her long-term husband perished in a car accident around this time. She only went on one date before deciding to get Travis's phone number. Yes, Travis remembered her. He thought it was not easy to forget a woman who exuded both style and elegance. He'd want to go to supper with her. Absolutely, he said. This happened some months before this event. The first date took place at an upscale restaurant, followed by a Philharmonic concert, for which Marla provided tickets. They closed the evening by kissing at her front door. The second date was a Saturday hike along the route. The woman laughed multiple times when Travis, who was plainly tired, had to take small breaks throughout the day. It appears that she and her late husband were avid climbers and hikers, and Travis believed he was in good health, but he was mistaken. He also discovered that Marla had a toned body for an older woman with captivating gray eyes. Marla and Travis completed their evening by making delicate love on the rug in her living room. Afterward, they had a passionate makeout session on the sofa. She piqued his interest with a mix of affluent status and girl-next-door freshness. Marla enthusiastically accepted when Travis proposed 
that she spend the weekend sightseeing in Chicago as part of their third date on their first date. Marla informed Travis that she had no plan of telling Warren that they were dating. If asked, she would not have disputed it, but she was not going to publicize the fact. Marla also told Travis that Lauren informed her co-workers that she and Travis were getting divorced owing to irreconcilable differences. Travis gave Marla the same narrative that he told everyone else. Lauren had cheated on him with at least two other men. He didn't elaborate any further in the two years following his divorce. Travis has had multiple deep connections and lived an incredible intimate life. All of Travis's partners thought highly of him, and some hoped that they would be considered when he decided to trust women again and marry. Lauren worked in a different direction, as she informed her then-husband before their first date. She was merely looking for fulfillment while still possessing the looks to entice practically any man. She was not looking for an emotional relationship like the majority of her lovers. This significant contrast between the two ex-partners would be problematic for Jackie. She and her mother were busy preparing for the approaching wedding, which your father was gladly paying for, and she informed her daughter that she believed both parents should attend the ceremony unaccompanied to reduce tension. Jackie readily agreed with this concept, which she shared with her father over lunch that same week. Does this beautiful idea come from you or your mother? Travis inquired harshly. I intend to bring a lady with me. I'm paying for this holiday, and I'm going to have a great time with the one I get. Hell, I've been taking dance lessons for about a year, ever since you revealed your engagement. Have you taken your dance classes seriously? Only for my wedding. This is really cute. But, no buts, Jackie. She does not have anyone close enough to invite, so she is attempting to put pressure on me. Again, she acts selfishly and attempts to exploit the situation to her advantage. Sorry, sweetie, but I will not be attending my daughter's wedding without a date. If you don't have the bravery to tell her, I will. She can go on her own. Alternatively, she may take a gentleman with her. That is her business. I will bring the lady with me, Travis stated. I get it. Dad, I'll tell her. Your point is valid, and I would really like to see you dance. Could you still bring someone older than me? I can do it, sweetie. But you really should see how Sonia and I dance. Travis grinned broadly, and he received a broad smile in return. Travis Carney accompanied them to the wedding. Travis thinks she looks lovely in the green dress he paid for. They called because he purchased the dress. Travis explained to the woman that because he was the bride's father and would be dressed in a tuxedo, she required a new dress, which she would gladly purchase. And yes, I understand that shoes are necessary, he informed her with a massive smile on his face. Walking his eldest daughter down the aisle was both the best and worst experience Travis had ever had. Travis noted to himself that everything the other fathers had said about what would happen had been accurate. Nonetheless, it was a beautiful day. He, Carney, and his children enjoyed themselves and danced till late at night. The sole point of contention on this day was the appearance of his ex-wife with her own gentleman. Not that Travis cared, but the guy spent the first half of the ceremony smiling at Travis. The second half gazed at and groped ladies like an annoying drunk, at least until Jackie requested her mother to remove the visitor. Lauren, clearly humiliated, apologized loudly and immediately hustled the man out the door, departing with her date. Lauren nevertheless took the time to accompany Carney to the women's restroom. You're the one who stole my man, she told Carney when they were in the restroom. I apologize, but I have never stolen a man from anyone. Carney said. He divorced you before we were even dating. You have no one to blame for this. Divorce yourself. He's truly an extraordinary individual. Lauren's face became purple after a cheap night out. Her eyes, which had been fixed on the woman, suddenly darkened. She bowed her head and remained still as Carney walked out the door. Carney never spoke to Travis or his family since she did not want to ruin their great day. Michelle appeared uneasy when she visited her father a few months after the wedding. Travis observed her for a moment before voicing the inquiry. Okay, Mitch, what is going on? You've been nervous throughout the evening. Michelle blushed intensely and started to stutter. Travis felt something was seriously wrong. Dad, Mom occasionally mentions getting back together with you and how she will win you over after she stops having intimate relationships with other men. Did you two not have a night or anything? Did you? she asked. My nightlife is none of your concern. Young lady, Travis snapped, but no, I did not sleep with your mother. 
And what? Yes. The truth is that she has a venereal disease. Dad. I overheard the end of her talk with her friend Rosa, and she revealed that she had syphilis. Michelle spoke quietly without looking her father in the eye. Travis was astonished, then sorrowful, as Michelle watched him from the corner of her eye. You're telling me this because you're concerned about me, Travis said. However, it is customary state policy to notify all potential receivers of the disease that they must be checked. I didn't realize that. I was just concerned about you. Bad? She asked. I know mom is still asleep. Several of my acquaintances warned me that she was very promiscuous. It's always embarrassing when a friend tells you your mother is perfect. A few days later, Travis received an uncomfortable phone call from Mara. He knew almost once that she was worried about the same things Michelle was, but she was plainly concerned about her own health. If you're asking if I slept with my ex, the answer is not just no, but hell no, Travis explained. Believe me, Mara, I understand your worry, but I can't change the fact that my ex is a scandal. The scandal is the most flattering thing I've heard about her in a long time. In recent months, her activities outside the family have become the subject of sideline rumor. Morris stated that the longer she has been alone, the more she appears to let down her guard. Lauren used her research as a starting point for her plan to get Travis back. She felt content that she had had enough guys to last the rest of her life. Six months after the doctor declared her recovered, she launched a strategy to reclaim Travis. She still resented Travis for divorcing her. The first time was different from her initial intention. This idea could have worked if other ladies had yet to begin hunting Travis. Lauren was convinced that she was a treasure. She didn't expect Travis to be so drawn to other women. I know he's a lovely man, but can't these women understand that he's nothing near my level of intimacy? She commented to Rose one day as the two women sipped margaritas at the bar, waiting for their evening dates. Rose encouraged her pal towards her current lifestyle. She thought Travis was attractive, but she misjudged the depth of his personality, mainly because he always obeyed his wife. She expected Travis to hang around and mope while his wife had fun with other men. Who knew Travis had such a deep core? Lauren and Rose had been keeping an eye on Travis since Lauren issued the request. And in fact, his post-divorce life was nearly as intense as Lauren's. If Lauren had been more honest with herself, she could have admitted that her ex-husband's private life appeared to be far more emotionally satisfying. The voice on the other end of the line took Travis entirely by surprise. He last communicated with his ex-wife nearly two years ago. One of his daughters must have given her his new mobile phone number. He did not stop them from doing so, but he stated that he did not believe it was necessary to speak to her personally again. Hello, Trevor, she poured in her finest voice. I believe it's time for us to talk. I felt we shouldn't communicate until Mal got married. But since this is not yet the case, Travis suggested that we return to silence. Travis, everything is still the same. You're still attempting to deny your affection for me. But you know what? You love me. You know you want me back. Still the same, Travis, she responded. Do you still assume that everything revolves around you? Look, Trav, I know you're still upset with me, but I really love you. I should have cheated on you while keeping you in the dark. However, that would have been cheating. Lauren, it was still cheating. Just because you informed me you were going to do it doesn't make it any less accurate. You did it because you believed I would never give up on you. Do you think I am so pathetic? Lauren Travis commented, I know you think you're a 10. Hell, a 12. But more than that, you are stunning. I don't have to live in your shadow, as the last few years have shown me. I am not only the husband of a lovely woman. Other ladies value what I have to offer and are willing to compensate me emotionally. My last few years have been absolutely fantastic. Why would I want to date a selfish woman again who clearly does not respect me, and despite her claims, does not love me in the same way I loved her? I loved her in the past tense after disconnection. Travis put down his phone and turned to face the woman next to him. Are you prepared for the second round? He asked Sonia. Sonia eventually discovered her partner and married him. However, Carney and Mara maintained their contact with Travis. He fell in love with both of them in his own unique manner, but never married again. They each loved him in their own way, and both ladies accepted the connection. Furthermore, a few years later, they were invited to Travis's second daughter, Michelle's wedding. Lauren was not pleased, as she had not invited her boyfriend to the wedding. She protested to her daughter, but Michelle did not help her. 
After me, Jackie and her family, Carney and Mara, are Dad's two closest companions. Michelle responded, They loved Dad for who he is and prioritized him over their own selfish interests, which not everyone can see in themselves. He was yours, yet you left him for something more intimate. Why? Simply because she was frightened of growing old and assumed he had no other options. Then he wouldn't give up on you. Not for anything. You aren't for anyone. Travis was satisfied with his life, even though it was not his first choice. He left a situation he found untenable. Lauren's life was not full of loneliness and remorse. After all, she was still a lovely woman, and beautiful women frequently only needed to turn there for men to begin hitting on them. Lauren was often approached and had several short-term romances. However, they grew into something short-lasting. Lauren had to acknowledge that she regretted telling her husband that she was leaving him because she still couldn't accept that Travis had abandoned her so quickly. How could she have made such a massive error in calculations? She frequently wondered to herself. She was a 12 out of 10, but he was only a 6. It should not have ended like this.